بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله صلى الله تعالى عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا أما بعد فعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد Respected listeners, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Following our reading and study of the hadith of Abdullah ibn Abbas radiyallahu anhuma in Sahih al Bukhari relating to the family of the Prophet Ibrahim السلام, and their immigration to Mecca and the discovery of the well of Zamzam and the construction of the Kaaba. As promised today I will be speaking in further detail about the history and the virtues of Zamzam. We covered the hadith in detail over five weeks, and then last week we, well, I spoke about the virtues and the history of the Kaaba, and today, inshallah, I'll speak about the virtues and the history of Zimzim. Both these topics are directly related to that hadith, because this is what much of the hadith is about. As we learned, the Prophet Ibrahim, alayhi salam, by the command of Allah, took his wife Hajar radiyallahu anha and his newborn son Ismail السلام, from the land of Qan'an in modern day Palestine. And from there he took them to the barren valley of Mecca, which was uninhabited. In fact, there was nothing there, no vegetation, no water. It was a barren land, no sign of life. Having placed them there and having left only a bag of dates and a skin of water, Ibrahim السلام, turned around and departed. And at the edge of the valley, <coughs> at such a location that they could not see him, meaning his wife Hajar radiallahu anha could not see him. Ismail alayhi salam was still a baby. There, at that spot, he turned around at the edge of the valley and facing in the direction of where the Kaaba was would be built in the future. Since he had that knowledge, he made the following dua. Which Allah quotes in the Quran, Rabbana inni askantu min dhurriyati biwadin ghayri di zar'in inda baytika al muharram. Rabbana li yuqimu salat faj'al afidatan min al nas tahwi ilayhim. Warzukhum min al thamarat al alahum yashkurun. That, O our Lord, verily I have settled members of my family in a valley without any vegetation close to your sacred house. O oh, our Lord, I have done this so that they may establish salah. Therefore cause the hearts of the people to incline to them. Meaning in love. 
وَرْزُقْهُمْ مِنَ الثَّمَرَاتِ and provide for them, bless them with provisions. Provide for them fruits, of the fruits, in the hope that they may be grateful. Having made that dua, Ibrahim alayhi salam departed and left for Kana'an. And behind him he left Hajar radiyallahu anha and the baby son Ismail. When the of course, before he departed, she pleaded with him, asking him that, by whose command and instruction do you leave us like this? And Ibrahim salam informed her by, by the will and command of Allah. And she herself then said, in that case, Allah will not allow us to perish. Following his departure, Ismail uh, Hajar radiallahu anha and Ismail alayhi salam survived on the dates and the leather skin of water for as long as they could and then when the water and dates expired they both felt hungry and thirsty and in her desperation to find water for her son she ran to and fro and especially between the two she climbed the two hills of Safa and Marwa which were then later, later identified as Safa and Marwa and she ran in between them and that running to and fro was the basis for the ritual of Sa'i in Hajj and Umrah. I've exp explained all of this in detail. Then Jibreel alayhi salam came and she heard sound. She then spoke out. Jibreel alayhi salam responded and he then gave her glad tidings and he, rubbing his heel on the ground, caused the water of Zamzam to spring forth from the earth. And that was done in a miraculous manner by Jibreel alayhi salam. He gave her the glad tidings that this is close to the house of Allah that will be built by this child of yours and his father. And he, she was given further glad tidings relating to the well and the water of Zamzam. Some time later, Jurhum, a tribe originally from Yemen, who were nomads and who were in that area, they saw a bird hovering in, in the air and by its pattern of flying, they realized that this is circling something and it must be circling water. But amongst themselves, they discussed that we've never, we know this area in the sense that it would pass by, it was uninhabited, but it doesn't mean that no one had passed by there before. And they realized that we, they said, we know this area and there is no water to be found anywhere in this region. So they sent some scouts who then came back reporting that there is water there. They then went and requested Hajar radiallahu anha that can we camp near you? She agreed, because that's what she was looking for, on the condition that they would have no right or share to the water. And they agreed. And then they called for other family members and other clan members of their tribe. And eventually, Mecca grew as a settlement and then eventually a city over time. But prior to the arrival of Jurhum, Hajar radiallahu anha and her son Ismail alayhi salam, survived for some time only on the water of Zamzam. No food, just the water of Zamzam, before the arrival of Jurhum, uh, whilst Ismail alayhi salam was still a very young child. And then over time, the tribe of Jurhum grew, others joined them, but they remained the rulers and the most powerful people in that region. Soon after some time, the tradition of Ismail alayhi salam and his father Ibrahim alayhi salam disappeared. The, the, the whole tradition of Tawheed, of belief in one Allah, of sincerity, and the millah and the religion of Ibrahim alayhi salam, that was affected and polluted over time. Eventually, when Jurhum were joined by others and they became the sole, well, they were sole rulers, but they began to rule over others as well. The people became corrupt. And the tribe of Jurhum 
Of course, by this time, remember, Ibrahim السلام, had come and built the Kaaba, and both Ibrahim السلام, and his son Ismail السلام, had passed away. We're talking about many, many generations after that. When the tribe of Jurhum became tyrannical in their rule and corrupt in their conduct, the well of Zamzam, which sufficed all of them, as a punishment, a lot, well, part of their corruption was they revered the Kaaba, but part of their corruption was that they began stealing from the Kaaba. So when people would come and offer sacrifices and leave gold and silver in the Kaaba for the Kaaba, the Quraysh, the some people of the Jurhum, especially the powerful ones, the leaders, they would steal this wealth and appropriate it and use it for their personal ends. They were they would oppress others. Of course, there were many good people in their tribe who warned them of this, but to no avail. Eventually, as a punishment for their corruption and their abuse of the Kaaba, the house of Allah, and their abuse of Zamzam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused the well of Zamzam to seep deeper into the earth, to fall deeper into the earth, and eventually Zamzam, the traces of Zamzam ended. Of course, the water still existed, uh, subterrane, but the access to the water, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala closed it off for them. This was a punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that happens. We learn from more than one verse in the Qur'an that Allah's blessings, whatever their form, be it in food or drink, provisions or assistance, or wealth, or even children, or even health, all of these are gifts of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When they are not appreciated, not used as they should be, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes that gift away. Allah removes that ni'mah and that blessing because it's a test and the person's constantly failing in that test. And Allah gives the example of the people of Quraysh, where he says, وَضَرَبَ اللَّهُ مَثَلًا قَرِيَةً كَانَتْ آمِنَةً مُطْمَئِنَّةً يَأْتِيهَا رِزْقُهَا رَغَدًا مِنْ كُلِّ مَكَانٍ فَكَفَرَتْ بِأَنْعُمِ اللَّهِ فَأَذَاقَهُ اللَّهُ لِبَاسِ الْجُوعِ وَالْخَوْفِ بِمَا كَانُوا يَسْنَعُونَ Speaking of the people of Mecca, when they opposed the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they had all these blessings, the Quraysh, they had the Kaaba, they had the well of Zamzam, they had the presence of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who was uh, a tremendous blessing for them, despite their disbelief and opposition. One of the blessings and the barakat of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was that they would oppose him, taunt him, persecute him, challenge him. To the extent of saying to him that if this is the truth from your Lord, then tell your Lord that we disbelieve rain down stones on us from the heavens or bring forth a very clear and painful punishment. So they challenged the Prophet ﷺ saying to him that if this is true from your Lord and we are opposing you, well in punishment tell, your, tell Allah to rain down punishment on us or produce some painful punishment for us, rain down stones from the heavens. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and I'm summarizing the meaning of the verse, that they do deserve punishment. But, وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُعَذِّبَهُمْ وَأَنْتَ فِيهِمْ That as long as you are present amongst them, Allah is not one to punish them. So the very presence of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam warded off the adab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even though they deserved it. So they opposed the messenger, they disregarded the Kaaba, although they respected it, but only in their own way. They 
had the well of Zimzum, they had all these blessings. They enjoyed such prestige amongst the other tribes and people of Arabia because of Makkah al Mukarramah. But they disregarded all of this. Provisions would come to them as a dua of Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam. And look at the effect of the dua of Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam. He left Hajar radiallahu anha and Ismail alayhi salam. Then he went to the edge of the valley and he made that dua which I recited earlier on. And what was part of that dua? وَرْزُقْهُمْ مِّنَ الثَّمَرَاتِ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَشْكُرُونَ And provide for them of the fruits in the hope that they may be grateful. And he departed. And after he departed, as soon as the water expired and the mother and child became thirsty, Jibreel alayhi salam arrived with the first answer of that dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam and the first provision, the first miraculous provision, which was the water of Zamzam. So the water of Zamzam is the first manifestation of the acceptance of the dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam. The first of the many fruits that were to come later. So <clears throat> the fruits of Makkah al Mukarramah began very soon after the departure of Ibrahim alayhi salam and his dua and continued over the centuries and years, over millennia and generations, even till the time of the Quraysh, where despite being a barren valley, all kinds of fruits would arrive from all parts of the world, even then, just as they do now. But they did not appreciate any of this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in that verse, which I just recited, that strike for them. A parable of a city which was safe and secure which was content. They enjoyed safety and prosperity. Their provisions and their assistance would come to them, i.e. to the people of this city. And who is Allah speaking of? Makkah al Mukarrah. That their provisions and their fruits and their sustenance would come to them. Raghadan with ease and comfortably. Min kulli makan from all places. But what did the people of Mecca do? Fakafarat bi anumillah. They were unappreciative and ungrateful of the blessings of Allah. So what did Allah do in punishment? Allah caused them to Allah gave them a taste of the garments of hunger. Not Full hunger, Allah merely gave them the taste of the garment of hunger and of fear as a punishment of what they used to do. And this is a reference to the dua that Prophet ﷺ prayed against them. When they persecuted him, he then, in his exasperation, prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and said, Oh Allah, cause them to suffer a famine in the hope that they would be brought back. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did inflict a famine on the people of Quraysh, on, on Makkah al-Mukarramah. And that was a punishment. So this verse refers to that. I cite it just as an example that of the same Makkah al-Mukarramah, many, much, much, much earlier, when Jurhum occupied Makkah, when they were ungrateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they didn't appreciate the water of Zamzam, <coughs> and all the other blessings that Allah had bestowed upon them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deprived them of the blessing of the water of Zamzam. In fact, this is the actual meaning of a very famous verse of the Qur'an, which is often recited, but misunderstood. Even if Many people don't know the actual Arabic of the verse. Virtually everyone knows the meaning of the verse. Inna Allah la yughayyiru ma bi qawmin hatta yughayyiru ma bi anfusihim. That verily Allah does not change. The common translation is 
Allah does not change a condition of the people and they, until they change it themselves. Common translation. But think about it. Allah does not change a condition of a people until they change it themselves. This verse is often cited to show that Allah will not help you until you help yourselves. Or that if you don't make an effort, Allah won't change anything for you. And that you have to bring about change first before Allah brings about that change. So the verse is commonly cited for these reasons. But that's not what it means, because think of it simply. The, the apparent meaning is that indeed Allah does not change. Uh, I'm giving the common translation. Allah does not change the condition of a people until they change it themselves. So think about it. What that means, if there's a question here, if they change it themselves, what is there left for Allah to change? Allah does not change a condition of a people until they change it themselves. So if they change it themselves, what is left for Allah to change? The actual translation of the verse is as follows, and then I'll provide the meaning. In Allah la ma. Verily, Allah does not change ma that. Biqawmin, which is with the people. Hatta yughayiru, until they change ma that. Bi'anfusihim, which is with them, which is with themselves. So there are two words here, that. Allah does not change that, which is with the people, until they change that, which is with themselves or in themselves. So the two words, that, that, According to the previous translation, they both refer to the one and the same thing, which is, indeed, Allah does not change a condition of the people until they change it, meaning the condition themselves. But if Allah, if they change a condition, what is there left for Allah to change? What this verse actually means is what I explained using that verse of the Qur'an about Makkah al Mukarramah and the people of Jurhum. And the rule is for anyone and everyone. When Allah says, verily, Allah does not change that which is with the people, what he is referring to is the blessings that Allah has bestowed upon the people. So the first that refers to the blessings. Allah does not deprive a people of his blessings until they become corrupt. Sins deprive a person, a person of the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you sin, you are chipping away at your own risk. And often, what was destined for you can be taken away from you because of the sins you have committed. And good can come to you because of the good deeds that you perform. Unless someone says, well, that doesn't make sense because surely everything is already written. So whatever I'm going to receive, I will receive regardless of whether I do good or bad. Well, no. This is the mystery of Qadr. This is the Qadr of Allah and this is also the Qadr of Allah. As Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab radiyallahu an was when he spoke about at the time there was a plague and he said 
we should go from, he consulted the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, and eventually the decision was that they should go from that area and not enter the plague invested, infested area. So he was asked that, do we flee from the Qadr of Allah? That Allah has already decreed that this plague should strike this area. So if we are destined to die, and destined to be affected by it, then it won't make a change whether we flee from it or we don't. We should continue. So Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu said, نَفِرُّ مِنْ قَدْرِ اللَّهِ إِلَىٰ قَدْرِ اللَّهِ We flee from the Qadr of Allah to the Qadr of Allah. Both are the Qadr of Allah, because Qadr is a mystery. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as I said, there is more than one verse of the Qur'an which informs us. That Allah deprives people of his blessings and of good fruits and of good things as a result of their misdeeds and their corruption. <coughs> so much so that the tribe of Jurhum, because of their corruption and their misdeeds, they even lost access to the well of Zamzam. So Jurhum eventually, over time, they lost access to the well of Zumzum. They sufficed with other water that they managed to find or which sprung up in the surrounding area, but not the well of Zumzum. Then, the tribe of Khuza'a came, invaded the area, they replaced Jurhum. In fact, most of Jurhum perished. Khuza'a became the, the tribe of Khuza'a became the rulers of Mecca. And then after some time, Quraysh. There was an ongoing battle between the Quraysh and Khuza'a, and then eventually Quraysh attacked Khuza'a, and they became the rulers of Mecca, and the roles were reversed. Quraysh was on the outside, Mecca was occupied by the Khuza'a. They invaded, they drove out the Khuza'a, now the Khuza'a who are out of Mecca, Quraysh, uh, became the rulers of Mecca, and that was under the leadership of Qusay ibn Kilab. And Qusay ibn Kilab was one of the ancestors of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, one of his great grandfathers. Qusay, since he was the, he became the ruler and the, shall we say, the first amongst the chieftains of the clans of Quraysh, and he divided the privileges of looking after the Kaaba and providing its services in terms of its upkeep, its maintenance, and a famous one known as Siqaya. Siqaya meant the privilege of watering the pilgrims. So this, all these duties and privileges were divided amongst the clans. And Siqaya continued during the fam uh, in the family of, well, from, in the Quraysh, it came down to his son, Qusay's son, Abdu Manaf, who was a great-great-grandfather of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abdu Manaf was now responsible for the well of, uh, sorry, for f feeding people, uh, for watering the pilgrims. Zamzam, the well of Zamzam had disappeared. But the people knew the history. They knew that there used to be a well of Zimzim here. And they were constantly scouting for it, but they could never find it. All they knew that is that they, it had disappeared. So the watering of the pilgrims still continued, regardless, using other water. So Qusay's son, Qusay, when he became the ruler of Mecca, as a tribe of a leader of the Quraysh, when they invaded and drove out Khuzara, he passed on the responsibility of watering the pilgrims who still came to the Kaaba to his son Abdu Manaf, who was a great grandfather of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abdu Manaf would wa provide water for the pilgrims. For them, it was an act of honor, prestige, and a service to the house of Allah. Where would he get the water from? He'd get it from the surrounding areas and he'd fill ponds and pools with water and they used to have a tradition of mixing raisins, soaking raisins in the water to make it sweet and this is how they would water the pilgrims. But they were constantly in the, on the search for the well of Zimzum that had disappeared. 
Abdul Manaf then passed on this responsibility to his son Hashim. And Hashim passed on the same responsibility of Siqaya, of watering the pilgrims, to his son Abdul Muttalib, the grandfather of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So it was Muhammad, the son of Abdullah, the son of Abdul Muttalib, the son of Hashim, the son of Abdul Manaf, the son of Qusay. So Abdul Muttalib became the leader of the Quraysh and he continued with the tradition of watering the pilgrims, but not from the well of Zamzam. However, he was still, like all the others, searching for the well. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to reintroduce the well of Zamzam to the people of the world prior to the arrival of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And look at the connection between the well of Zamzam and the arrival of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Since Abdul Muttalib was the leader of the clan of Banu Hashim, named after his father, the Hashim's other brothers, Abdul Shams, Muttalib, Nawfal, they had their own clans, and they were all rivals of each other. Although they were all from one tribe, it's human nature. And the Arabs have a saying, that it's me against my brother, but it's me and my brother against my cousin brother. And then it's me and my brother and my cousin brother against you. So, although they were all from one family, they quarrelled and they had inner rivalries, inter-rivalries, inter and then clans would oppose each other. So, although they were all from the same ancestor, they were all ultimately the children of Abdul Manaf, they fought and argued amongst themselves and they were rivals. So, Abdul Muttalib faced a lot of pressure from the other tribe, other leaders of the clans. And as part of that pressure, he, although he was a leader of Mecca, they taunted him because one of the things which he, unfold, well, which he was deprived of at that time was that he only had one son. And that was Al-Harith, the eldest son. He didn't have other children. And the Arabs prided themselves on male children. And because it was a tribal society based on clans and families, the others taunted Abdul Muttalib, although he was a leader, they said to him, they were challenging his leadership. And as part of that challenge, they would say to him, that, how can you rule over us when you only have one son? That's exactly what they said about the Prophet wasallam, That he is trying to lord over us when he has no male progeny. So they said the same thing to his grandfather, Abdul Muttalib, that you are trying to lord over us and rule over us. How long will you last? You don't have children, you only have one, Hashim, uh, Al-Harith. Abdul Muttalib made a vow to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that vow was, remember he was still searching for the well of Zamzam. That vow was that, O oh Allah, if you show me Zamzam and I'm able to successfully locate Zamzam and dig up the well and find that water and if you give me ten sons I will offer one of them in sacrifice to you. It was their understanding. Just as Ibrahim alayhi salam, who was their ancestor, he was willing to offer his son Ismail alayhi salam as a sacrifice. And we are in the days of sacrifice. Next week, we're, most of us will be doing Qurbani. So, in the tradition of Ibrahim alayhi salam, he said, Oh Allah, if you allow me to locate the well of Zimzim, which has disappeared, but which we know of, which we have heard of which is the well of our ancestor Ismail alayhi salam. And if you give me ten sons, then 
in gratitude, I will offer one of them in sacrifice to you. He said it in a moment of passion. Soon thereafter, he himself related that he was sleeping in the hijr, the, the hatim, the broken section of the Kaaba that I was speaking of last week, and as I've discussed before, he was sleeping inside there. And I've also mentioned that Abdul Muttalib, being the leader of the Quraysh, he would have his seat of honor there, and that's where he would sit. So he was sleeping there when he saw, the, when he saw a dream. In the dream, he was told, go and dig the well of Zimzim. And he was given the location that close to the well of Zimzim, which has disappeared, is an ant colony. A mound of earth with an ant colony. So he saw three dreams like that. Abdul Muttalib eventually got up alone with his one son, Al Harith. The two of them went and they began digging. The Quraysh gathered and they realized that since Abdul Muttalib is in charge of Siqaya, the watering of the pilgrims, and he's digging for water, has he located Zamzam? <coughs> So they began taunting him and pressurizing him but Abdul Muttal and trying to thwart him from continuing with the work and later claiming it for themselves. Abdul Muttalib ignored them and carried on. Eventually he struck the original walls of the well of Zamzam and he, sh- he did the kabir. And then everyone gathered. The Quraysh said, we want to share in it too. And he said, no. You cannot have a share. So they argued and fought over that. So even though the well of Zimzum was discovered, the Quraysh were trying to claim the well of Zimzum collectively for everyone. And Abdul Muttalib said, it's only for me and my family, meaning we will control it. They said, no, it has to be accessible to everybody. He said, this is mine. Because of my glad tidings, my dream, my discovery. So they said... We are going to, have to get someone to arbitrate between us. So who will arbitrate? Eventually they agreed on a soothsayer, a woman. So they all travelled, the whole, the leaders of the tribe of Quraysh travelled through across the desert for the adjudication of this soothsayer. They were pagans. On the way, their water ran out. So they were deciding what to do. It's a long story, I'll cut it short. Abdul Muttalib, where his camel was, when he climbed on his camel, they agreed that let's go and look for some more water here and there. So they all accepted. When Abdul Muttalib climbed on his camel and his camel rose and it moved right from beneath his camel, water sprung forth, water gushed. When the Quraysh saw that, They said, this is a sign from Allah. We do not contest you in the control and ownership of the well of Zimzum. We relinquish to you. So they all returned to that. If Allah has given you water here in the desert, then we accept that Allah has given you the water of Zimzum. So they went back to Mecca. Upon his return to Mecca, Abdul Muttalib now had to fulfill his... Allah gave him children. He controlled Zimzum. Then he had many sons after Al Harith. And who was Al Harith? Al Harith was the father of Ubaidah radiallahu an, who was the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's cousin brother, Ubaidah ibn al Harith, the one who was martyred in the Battle of Badr. The first martyr of the Battle of Badr, Ubaidah ibn al Harith, cousin brother of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and son of his eldest uncle. So after Al-Harith, many of the sons were born and eventually he had to fulfill his promise, although he was reluctant to do so because he said it in a moment of passion. It's like when people say, oh, if Allah gives me this, I'll give everything away. And then when they see the light of day, somehow they want to wriggle out of their vow. So Abdul Muttalib one didn't want to fulfill his sacrifice, but he didn't know what to do. Again, he consulted a soothsayer, and she advised him accordingly. She said, what is the 
compensation of one person, meaning blood money. So they said 10 camels. So she said, fine, what you do is that you draw lots. Uh, you put down your son's name, and of all of his children, who was the most beloved to him? The Prophet ﷺ's father, Abdullah. So he said, I'll sacrifice one of my sons. And he kept on drawing lots. And instead of anyone else, he always came back to Abdullah, the father of Rasulullah. So so many times he realized that the choice fell on Abdullah, but he was loath to sacrifice him. So he consulted the soothsayer. The soothsayer said, fine, what you do is that you take Abdullah's name, you mark it, and you, you then t uh, mark something else with the camels, and then you draw lots. So every time Abdullah's name comes out, you just add the camels. So that's what Abdul Muttalib did. Drew lots, Abdullah's name came out. So he added 10 to the camels. So now it became 20 camels. So shall I slaughter 20, sacrifice 20 camels or Abdullah? Drew lots, Abdullah's name came out. I can't do it, I'll add 10. It was a game. So he continued until 100, over 10 times, till the 100th camel. It was always, sorry, he kept on adding. Only after he made it 100 camels did the camels lot come out and not the father of Rasulullah So he said, there we are, it's the camels. So he slaughtered 100 camels. This is why before in the Quraysh, blood money was 10 camels. So if someone killed uh, another family, well, if someone killed someone else, either in error or deliberately, but they didn't want to seek retaliation, they would settle for blood money. And the blood money was 10 camels. But from the time of Abdul Muttalib after this incident, because of the father of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and his compensation with 100 camels, the deer, the compensation and blood money, rose from 10 camels to 100 camels amongst the Arabs. So... Abdullah, the father of the Prophet sallallahu was spared. The, in fact, one of the names of the father of Abdullah was the Bih, the one to be slaughtered. Just as Ismail alayhi salam was called the Bih, the father of the Prophet sallallahu was also called the Bih, the one to be slaughtered, because he was going to be sacrificed by his father Abdul Muttalib. In any case, he was loath to do so because he was his favorite son. And then from Abdullah, he married Abdullah to Amina bint Wahab. And then Prophet ﷺ was born. So the well of Zamzam was discovered not too long before the birth of Rasulullah ﷺ. Now the Quraysh, they always respected the well of Zamzam. Zamzam has so many names. Some ulama have said that Zamzam has over 60 names. Just the well of Zamzam. He has over 60 names. But what does Zamzam itself mean? Now, there are many differences of opinion. I won't go into all of the different details. But the most probable meaning of Zamzam is that it's merely a reflection of the sound and the murmuring of the water. Because the Arabs would refer to anything that was abundant and that was endless and infinite as zamzam or zumazim. So because of the water being infinite and endless, they, the name zamzam, uh, along with the fact that it's endless and abundant, and also because of the sound of the murmuring and the gushing of the water, they named it zamzam and the name stuck. Who named it zamzam? We believe it was from the time of Hajar radiyallahu anha, and Ismail alayhi salam, and the original inhabitants of Makkah al-Mukarramah, who were the tribe of Jurun. The name of Zamzam is related to the sound and of the water, as well as the 
the murmur and the sound of the water, as well as to the fact that it's abundant and endless in its supply. And the name goes back from the earliest days, from the time of Ismail and Hajar السلام, and the people of Jurhum who first occupied Makkah al Mukarramah. The Quraysh always treated the well of Zamzam with great reverence. And for the family of Abdul Muttalib being responsible for the well of Zamzam and watering the pilgrims was a source of great pride. Now, as far as the water of Zamzam itself is concerned, how did they view it? How good is it? How good was it? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says in a hadith later by Imam Tabarani and by others that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said خير ما إن على وجه الأرض ماء زمزم فيه طعام من الطعم وشفاء من السقم The best water on the face of the earth is the water of Zamzam. Therein is the nourishment of food and the cure of illness. So the Prophet ﷺ says in this authentic hadith, he says three things of the well of the of the water of Zamzam. One, it's the best water without exception on the face of the earth. Two, it has in it nourishment from hunger, the nourishment of food, and it has a cure of illnesses. Now speaking about it being the best water, Allah Akbar, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala undoubtedly chose the location of Makkah al Mukarramah for the water. So look where the well of Zimzim, the water of Zimzim, where did it spring from? Where did it gush forth first? At the heel of Jibreel alayhi salam. Right next to the Kaaba, the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For the sake of Ismail alayhi salam. And as an answer to the dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam. That is the blessed location of Zimzim. Furthermore, Abdullah ibn Abbas radiyallahu anhumah, he says, and Imam Abu Bakr ibn Abi Shayba rahmatullahi alayhi relates this hadith in his, Muslim, in his Musannaf. It's not, it's not a hadith. These are the words of Abdullah ibn Abbas radiyallahu anhumah. But as I've explained in detail in the same hadith of Bukhari from Abdullah ibn Abbas radiyallahu anhumah that we've been studying, it's a rule. That if the Sahaba radiallahu anhum say something which they cannot say of their own accord or of their own opinion, then we accept that this must have been told to them by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhum said that the origin of Zamzam is Jannah. And one of the springs that leads into Zamzam, he says that is from Jannah. So the origin of the water of Zamzam is Jannah. So undoubtedly it's blessed. Furthermore, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he was a child, and he was sent by his mother Aminah, to Banu Sa'd with Halima, Sa'diya radiallahu anha, who was his mother who suckled him. And he was playing outside with his siblings, milk brothers and sisters. All of a sudden, the brothers came running, frightened and terrified to the mother and father, and they said, our brother from the Quraysh, meaning Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, they were playing together. They said something has happened to him. So the family rushed there. Halima radiyallahu anha 
Prophet Sallallahu's milk father and the other children. And there the Prophet Sallallahu was coming towards them pale and somewhat frightful. And they asked him what had happened. And then he explained that two men came to me and they made me lie down. And then they opened me up and they took out a piece of flesh and they washed my innards with water. Now, that's how it was explained then, but in retrospect, what had happened? Jibreel alayhi salam had come with another angel and they had brought with them the water of Zamzam. And they laid down the Prophet وسلم, opened up his bosom. And as Malik radiallahu an relates this hadith recorded by Imam Muslim in his Sahih. That Anas bin Malik radiallahu anhu says the angels came, Jibreel alayhi salam, and they laid down the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and they opened up his bosom, and they washed his heart with the water of Zimzim. And then they sealed it up. Anas bin Malik radiallahu anhu says, because he stayed with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, that I actually saw, he would see the stitch marks on Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from the opening of that bosom. And that's what's referenced in the Holy Quran in Surah Alam Nashrah. Alam Nashrah Laka Sadrak. Did we not expand your bosom? And that's both physical and metaphorical. Then Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi and others all relate from more than one Sahabi radiyallahu an. And this narration of Bukhari is from Abu Dhar al Ghifari radiyallahu an who says that the Prophet related to them that when he was in his... This is a reference to the story of Isra and Mi'raj, the miraculous journey from Mecca to Bayt al-Maqdis to Jerusalem and from al-Masjid al-Aqsa to the heavens and back. Rasulullah informed them that before he was carried by Jibreel alayhi salam on the Buraq, on that miraculous journey, in preparation for that journey, Jibreel alayhi salam brought a tray of gold from Jannah. And in there was contained the water of Zamzam. And with that water, the heart of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam was washed again before he was carried to the, to, on that miraculous journey to Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa and then onwards to the heavens. And even though the tray of gold was brought from Jannah, the water was actually from Zamzam. So this is undoubtedly, as the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, خَيْرُ مَا إِنْ عَلَى وَجْهِ الْأَرْضِ مَا زَمْزَمْ The best water on the face of the earth is the water of Zamzam. There are many blessings Rasulullah alayhi salatu wasalam would drink of that water a lot. And not just for the sake of drinking water, but when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam was in, when, when he left Mecca and he did hijrah to Medina, even though he was at loggerheads with the Quraysh and they were enemies. And the two state cities of Mecca and Medina were enemies of each other. Despite that, the Prophet wasallam sent a message to Suhail ibn Amr that send me a gift of the water of Zimzam. So subhanAllah, the Prophet wasallam was in Al-Madinat al munawwarah And this was before the conquest of Mecca. The Quraysh were his enemy. Suhail ibn Amr was his enemy. At that, till that time, he hadn't embraced Islam. We'll learn a lot about him in the upcoming hadith of Hudaybiyah. So the Prophet wasallam sent word to Suhail ibn Amr, radiyallahu anh, 
and said to him, send me a gift of the water of Zimzim. For if you do send it to me, it won't decrease for you in any way. So Suhail ibn Amr actually sent two casks of water to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa from Mecca to Medina, and this was before the conquest of Mecca. That shows how much the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa valued the water of Zamzam that he requested that even the Quraysh of his enemies send it to him as a gift. And after the conquest of Mecca, Allahu Akbar, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as Umm al-Mu'mineen Aisha radiyallahu anha says in a hadith related by Imam Tirmidhi in his sunan, Umm al-Mu'mineen Aisha radiyallahu anha, whenever she would go to Mecca, she would pack the water of Zimzum, i.e. bottle it in skins and bottles and casks, and then she would carry it back to Medina with her and she would say this is what the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would do so even though he was a prophet of allah the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would carry the water of zamzam from mecca back to medina and he valued the water so much that as i mentioned a few years ago in the commentary of kitabul hajj the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he arrived in mecca al mukarramah after the conquest of mecca and the Quraysh, uh, when he arrived at the well of Zamzam, the Sahaba radiyallahu anhum, Al-Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib. Abdul Muttalib, he had the responsibility of Siqaya. So Qusay was a conqueror of Mecca. He passed on the privilege and the responsibility of Siqaya, the watering of the pilgrims, to his son Abdul Manaf, who passed it to his son Hish, uh, Hashim, who passed it to his son Abdul Muttalib. Abdul Muttalib then passed it to his son Abbas. So Al Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib, he was responsible, even when he wasn't a Muslim, for the siqaya, for watering the pilgrims. So when the Prophet was in Mecca, he came to Mecca, the Prophet came to the well of Zamzam. Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib was there administering the water, giving it to people. He had his family members and workers all pulling out and drawing water, giving it to others, passing it. So the Prophet ﷺ said, give me to drink. Give me water to drink. And he meant the water of Zamzam. So Abbas, because people would climb into the well, so the Prophet ﷺ and people would dip their fingers in, climb into the well. So Abbas turned to his son, Fadl, and he said to him, Go home and tell your mother to give some water to Rasulullah ﷺ. He wanted other water from the house, which was cleaner in his view for the Prophet ﷺ. So the Prophet ﷺ said, No, give me water to drink. So... Al-Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib said, Ya Rasulullah, people jostle for water here, they fight with each other for the water, and they dip their hands in it, and they climb into the well, and he could see the people climbing into the well. So he said, Ya Rasulullah, I've ordered different water from home for you. So the Prophet wasallam said, No, give me water to drink. So then, water was drawn from the well of Zamzam. And the Prophet ﷺ drank. On one occasion, Prophet ﷺ walked up to the well of Zamzam. And he saw the people standing in the well, drawing water, passing it on for others to drink. The Prophet ﷺ said, Continue with whatever you are doing, for you are performing a very good deed. And if it wasn't for the fact that you would be overwhelmed by the people, I would also descend into the well and I would draw water alongside you so much so that I would throw the rope on this shoulder of mine like this. And what's the meaning of you will be overwhelmed? Because everyone wanted the privilege of drawing water. But who was that exclusive for? Who had the right and the privilege of watering the pilgrims? The Banu al-Abbas. Not even the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, as long as the privilege was with Banu al-Abbas, only the family of Abbas radiyallahu an could 
enjoy that privilege of watering the pilgrims. But if the Prophet ﷺ descended into the well, then everybody would want to follow his example. So in order to, and if he did so, then people would overwhelm the family of Abbas and they would no longer enjoy this exclusive privilege. So the Prophet ﷺ said, if it wasn't for the fear that you would be overwhelmed, i.e. by the other people who would then follow my example, if it wasn't for that fear, I would also descend into the well of Zimzum and I would draw water alongside you, watering the pilgrims, and I would throw the rope on the shoulder of mine, and then the Prophet وسلم, pointed to it. And uh, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal rahmatullahi relates hadith in his Musnad, again from Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, that the Prophet and others too, that the Prophet وسلم, came to the well of Zimzum. He drank the water and then he, he asked for water, so he was given water. The Prophet ﷺ drank and then after drinking from the water, the remaining water, he washed his mouth and gargled with it. And then after gargling with that water, he spat it back into the bowl and then he gave it to Abba, uh, Abdullah ibn Abbas anhuma, and he says, Abdullah ibn Abbas says, we then threw that water back into the well of Zimzum. And in one narration, he told them after spitting into it and gargling and spitting into the water, that throw it back into the well of Zimzum. Yes, the Prophet wasallam spat in it. And it was thrown into the well of Zimzum. But for those who love Rasulullah wasallam, as the Sahaba radiallahu anhum did, this was something unique and only the love of Rasulullah alayhi salatu wasalam can explain this as the ambassador of the Quraysh told them they said go to him and negotiate with him see if you can come to some sort of agreement with uh, Muhammad the son of Abdullah so this ambassador went when he came back he told them he said oh my people I say to you Leave Muhammad be. Leave him as he is. For soon he will have a unique status. And his condition will be great. His star is rising. And you will not be able to oppose him. For I say to you that leave him be. If he is an imposter, then soon the Arabs, the rest of the Arabs will take care of him. And your need will have been fulfilled. You won't have to do anything. But if he is not an imposter, and if he succeeds, then why do you wish to oppose him? His success is your success. So leave him be. Time will take care of everything. And then he went on to explain to the Quraysh. He said, by Allah, I have been to the royal courts of Abyssinia, of Rome, of Persia, and I have seen no emperor, no king, no ruler more loved and honoured by his people than I have seen Muhammad being honoured and loved by his people. When he, speak, when he whispers, they strain their ears to listen to him attentively. When he whispers a command, they rush to try to outdo each other in fulfilling that command. When he spits... They actually jostle with each other to catch his saliva, and then when they catch his saliva, they anoint their faces and their bodies with his saliva. When he spits water, when he performs the ablution, they try to catch the water of his ablution, of his wudu. So I say to you, leave Muhammad be. And indeed, that was how Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was seen and treated by those who were older than him. His own fathers-in-law, Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhumah, treated him as a messenger of Allah, not as a son-in-law. His wives treated him as a, as a messenger of Allah, not so much as a husband. And the following story illustrates this beautifully. Imam Muslim rahmatullahi alayhi, Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi, both relate a famous story that Abu Musa al-Ash'ari radiyallahu an and Bilal ibn Rabah radiyallahu an were both seated with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and as I explained in the commentary of the book of Hajj this may have been in Ji'arana in Makkah al-Mukarramah 
So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was seated there and a Bedouin came. And he said to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, O Muhammad, fulfill your promise that you made to me. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to him, Abshir, receive the glad tidings. The Arabs, even now and always, have had this phrase, Abshir, which means receive the glad tidings. And the meaning of receive the glad tidings is consider it done. So if someone says to another, look, can you, uh, you promise that you, uh, will you do this for me tomorrow? So instead of, well, we say consider it done. So the Arabs say, and they always said, abshir, meaning receive the glad tidings. It's done. So the Bedouin said to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Muhammad, fulfill the promise to me that you made. So the Prophet ﷺ said to him, Abshir, receive the glad tidings. So being a Bedouin, he said to the Prophet ﷺ that you've given me enough of your Abshir. Meaning, I've had enough of your Abshir, Abshir. Always telling me Abshir. Give me what I want, don't tell me Abshir. That's what he meant. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Abshir. So he said, you've given me enough of your Abshir. I've had enough of your Abshir. So the Prophet ﷺ became angry. But he didn't say anything to him. He turned to Abu Musa al-Ash'ari and Bilal ibn Rabah radiyallahu anhumah who was seated with him. And he said to them, this one has rejected my Bushra, the glad tidings. So why don't you two accept my Bushra, the glad tidings? So both of them, Bilal ibn Rabah and Abu Musa al-Ash'ri radiyallahu anhuma said, Qabilna ya Rasulullah, we have accepted your glad tidings. They didn't know what it was. They said, we have accepted your glad tidings. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam ordered a bowl of water. So the bowl of water came. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam washed his hands in it and then his face in it. And then he spat in the bowl of water. And having washed his hands and his face, and the remnants of that water, with the uh, drops dripping back into the bowl, he then spat into it. And then he gave it to them. And then he gave it to Bilal and Abu Musa radiyallahu anhuma. And he said to both of them, drink from this and pour it over your faces and your bosoms. For this is the glad tidings. So Abu Musa al-Ash'ari and Bilal radiyallahu anhumah both took the water, they drank heartily and they washed their faces and they threw the water on, their, on themselves. Now why did I relate this story? Because I said, Umar ibn al-Khattab and Abu Bakr radiyallahu anhumah treated him as a messenger of Allah, not as a son-in-law. And the wives treated him as a messenger of Allah, not so much as a husband. So when Abu Musa al-Ash'ari and Bilal ibn Rabah radiyallahu anhuma poured the water and they drank from it, who was listening to everything? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam's wife, Umm Salama radiyallahu anha from behind the curtain. So she spoke out addressing Abu Musa and Bilal radiyallahu anhuma that leave some for your mother. <laughs> leave some water for your mother. So Abu Musa al-Ash'ari radiyallahu an passed on the water to Umm Salama radiyallahu anha and she drank from that water that was spat in by the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and that he washed his face and his hands in and she also anointed herself with it. That's how the wives saw him. They would collect his sweat, his perspiration whilst he was sleeping like Umm Sulaim radiyallahu anha used to do and she would then give a gift of his itr his sweat was, a, was given as a gift by Umm Sulaim to the other wives. They would ask a give us and they themselves would collect. Their perfume was a sweat of the Messenger of Allah. So people treated him differently. And undoubtedly, there, yes, he spat back in the well of Zimzim, but there is barakah in the spit of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ali radiallahu anhu was given the flag on the morning of battle. But he complained to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya Rasulullah, you've given me the flag and I will be the standard bearer on this day and victory shall come at my hands. 
but I am suffering from the inflammation of the eyes. So the Prophet ﷺ, on the morning of battle, he spat and he rubbed his saliva on the eyes of Ali ibn Abi Talib and he was cured instantly. The saliva of Rasulullah ﷺ was a cure for the Sahaba and he spat back in the well of Zamzam. In fact, again, we are going to study the hadith of al hudaybiyah after the holidays, inshallah, after Eid. On the occasion of Hudaybiyyah, Al-Bara ibn Azib radiyallahu anhu relates, and so do other Sahaba radiyallahu anhu, that we were at the well in Hudaybiyyah, and we exhausted the supply of water. There was no water left. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came, we complained to him, he came, he spat in the well, and lo and behold, the water rose again. And we drank from it. We gave it to our animals. And then the Sahaba radiallahu anhum say, there were 1400 of us. But the Sahabi says, by Allah, if we were 100,000, that water would have sufficed us. And that was through the barakah of the spit of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So yes, he spat back in the water, but that was his connection with the well of Zimzim. He insisted on drinking from the well of Zimzim. He insisted on wanting to descend into the well of Zimzum and drawing the water with pails and buckets and ropes and manually working in order to give other people water to drink from Zimzum. He has a unique status. So as the Prophet says, the best water on the face of the earth is the water of Zimzum. And the second thing he says, it is why fihi ta'amun min at Therein is nourishment for food, i.e. Zimzim is so nutritious that it can actually replace food. Hajar radiallahu anha and Ismail alayhi salam, they survive for such a long time just in the water of Zimzim. Abu Dhar al-Ghifari radiallahu anha, I spoke about him some months ago. You can listen to the whole talk. And didn't I mention then that when he first came to Mecca, he wasn't a Muslim. But he wanted to learn about the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He had to do so secretly, and he came from a tribe that was notorious for robbers, for being vagabonds and dacoits and robbers, highway robbers. But he came in search of Islam, and he had to do so secretly. So he lived in Mecca for thirty days before he approached Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam alone. So when he approached the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He introduced himself. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Who are you? So he introduced himself. Where are you from? So he said, I am from Banu Ghifar. Then the Prophet ﷺ said to him, How long have you been in Mecca? He said, For 30 days, one whole month. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Who has been catering for you, feeding you? So Abu Dhar al Ghifari said, That no one. So the Prophet ﷺ said, How have you sustained yourself? So he said, for the whole month, I have been doing nothing but drinking the water of Zimzim. And it has filled me and satiated me, so much so that my stomach has expanded. And the wrinkles of my, it, it feels like the wrinkles, or quite simply the lining of my stomach is about to burst. And I have felt no hunger. So Abu Dhar al-Ghifari radiyallahu and survived for a whole month just in the water of Zimzim. And throughout history, ulama have done that. Not only ulama, ubad, sulaha, people who go for hajj and for umrah, and they spend time there. They, many people have survived for a whole month, 40 days, just on Zimzim. And not only that, but they would also do tawaf and do umrah and worship Allah and do everything just surviving on Zimzim. So it's nourishment for food. And then the Prophet ﷺ gives a third, second reason for it being the best water on earth. It's a cure for illnesses, undoubtedly. In fact, the Prophet ﷺ has said in a hadith later by Abdullah ibn Abbas that if you are suffering, one of his companions said, I'm suffering, he was absent. So Abdullah ibn Abbas saw him after some time. So he said, where have you been? 
She says, oh, I've contracted fever. I'm suffering from fever. So Abdullah ibn Abbas said to him, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us that fever is from the, uh, is from the heat of Jahannam. So cool the fe- heat of fever with the water of Zamzam. And drink it, you should be cured. And indeed, there is a cure in the water of Zamzam for everything. And in a hadith later by Jabir ibn Abdullah radiyallahu anhu, recorded by Ibn Majah in his Sunan and by others, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Ma zamzam lima lah. The water of Zamzam is for that purpose for which it is drank. Meaning it fulfills that purpose for which it is drank. So if you drink the water of Zamzam for a cure, Allah will inshallah cure you. If you drink the water of Zamzam for your dua to be accepted, then inshallah your dua will be accepted. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiyallahu and being who he was, he used to drink the water of Zamzam with the following dua. He used to say, oh Allah, I drink this water of Zamzam in the hope that you will quench my thirst on the day of judgment. And that was Umar ibn al-Khattab radiyallahu anhu. The Sahaba radiyallahu anhum would do the same for cure, for the answering of dua, for the prayers. And this is, a authentic, this is an authentic hadith. The water of zamzam is for that, is, fulfills that for which, it, for which it is drank. You drink the water of zamzam with a dua, inshallah, Allah will cure you. And throughout history, there have been many examples of people being cured just with the water of zamzam. Paralysis. Blindness. In fact, Abdullah ibn Abbas anhuma, when he used to drink the water of Zamzam, he would recite, Allahumma inni as'aluk ilman nafi'a wa rizqan wasi'a wa shifa'an min kulli da. Oh Allah, I seek from you beneficial knowledge and abundant provisions and sustenance and a cure from every illness and disease. So there is a cure. And ulama have drank the water of Zamzam with the intention of their dua being accepted. And there are many stories, we don't have time to go into any of them, but there are many, many stories of the ulama making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then witnessing the acceptance of that dua from Allah azza wa jal. Many ulama prayed for ilm, prayed for knowledge. Ibn Khuzayma, rahmatullahi alayhi, one of the famous authors of hadith, he died in 311 Hijri. People asked him, that how did Allah bestow such knowledge on you? And he said, I drank the water of Zimzim with the intention that Allah gives me beneficial knowledge. The famous imam of hadith, hadith Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, rahimahullah, who died in 822 Hijri, sorry, 852 Hijri, and who's the famous commentator of Bukhari, whose book Fath al-Bari, who has this book, Fath al-Bari, he says of himself, he speaks of a famous scholar who came a century earlier, Imam Dhabi, rahmatullahi alayhi, who was renowned for his memory. So Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, rahimahullah, <coughs> he says that, I, pray, I drank the water of Zimzim when I was young, when I went to, for pilgrimage. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that, O oh Allah, grant me the memory of the Habi. Then Ibn Hajar himself writes that 20 years later, when I went back to the Haram of Mecca, I was able to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say confidently, that not only did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless me with the memory of Dhabi, but I actually surpassed it. And indeed, he, these ulama were encyclopedias. They were walking, talking libraries. Their feats of memory, their feats of learning are truly astounding. They would compile entire books just by dictating. They would have gatherings of knowledge. And they would come and sit. And they'd burn Bakhur. And then 
the students would take out their pens and papers and then the scholar would begin to dictate without a single paper, a single note, only from memory. And on some occasions, they would dictate entire books in one sitting or in a number of sittings. They were walking, talking supercomputers. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prepared all of them for the service of his religion. This is how the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has been preserved. And many of these ulama prayed for ilm after drinking the water of Zimzim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless their dua. Their love of hadith was truly astounding. Uh, I mentioned just two weeks ago that um, Sufyan ibn Uyayna, rahimahullah, well, uh, he was a famous muhaddith, of, famous teacher of hadith, great scholar of Makkah al-Mukarramah, who died in 198 Hijri. His chiefs, one of his chief students, some ulama say he was the chief student of Sufyan ibn Uyayna, was Abdullah ibn Zubayr al-Humaydi, who died in 219 Hijri. He was one of Imam Bukhari's greatest teachers. Again, some people say he was his greatest teacher. There's a difference of opinion. The very first hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari about the sincerity of intention, who does Imam Bukhari, rahimahullah, relate it from? Haddathana al-Humaydi, Abdullah ibn al-Zubayr. His first teacher from which he narrates the first hadith of Bukhari is from the same Abdullah ibn al-Zubayr al-Humaydi. So Abdullah ibn al-Zubayr al-Humaydi says that we were seated with our Shaykh Sufyan ibn Uyayna, who was relating hadith to us. So he related this hadith to us that ma zamzam lima shuribala, the water of zamzam fulfills that purpose for which it is drank. So a, man, a young man stood up from the gathering and went out. And then he came back. And then he caught the attention of our Shaykh Sufyan ibn Uyayna, our Imam, and he said to him that the hadith that you have just related, that the water of zamzam fulfills the purpose for which it is drank, is that an authentic Sahih hadith? So he said, yes. So he says, well, I've just drank the water of Zamzam with the dua and intention that you will relate 100 hadith to me. <laughs> so Sufyan ibn Uyina said, well, in that case, come. And then he made him sit down and he related a whole hundred hadith to him. So their love of hadith, their love of knowledge, and a lot of it was to do with their dua after drinking the water of Zamzam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed great barakah in the water of Zamzam. It's one of the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when Allah says in the Quran that فِيهِ آيَاتٌ بَيِّنَاتٌ مَقَامُ إِبْرَاهِيمٌ That إِنَّ أَوَّلَ بَيْتٍ وُضِعَ لِلنَّاسِ لِلَّذِي بِبَكَّةَ مُبَارَكٌ وَهُدَ لِلْعَالَمِينَ فِيهِ آيَاتٌ بَيِّنَاتٌ مَقَامُ إِبْرَاهِيمٌ That indeed the very first house that was established on earth for, uh, for the people as a guidance and as a blessing is that house which is in Bakkah, meaning the Kaaba, Makkah al-Mukarramah. And then Allah says, therein are clear signs. And one of the clear signs of Al-Masjid al-Haram of Mecca is the well of Zamzam. There is much more to be said, but I'll suffice with this. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable us to understand. May Allah make us amongst those who appreciate the water of Zamzam and who are able to follow in the footsteps of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and drink of it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our intentions and our du'as and supplications upon the water of Zamzam. Uh, value it, cherish it. Of course, you don't, uh, I don't advise, well, remember, uh, what we learn about the ulama, what we learn about the sahaba radiyallahu anhum, they were a different breed of people. They were a different kind of people altogether. So not everything that you hear about them, you need to follow in their footsteps. I once related about Khalid ibn al-Walid radiyallahu an, who drank poison. <laughs> so someone actually came to me and said, you, you said about Khalid ibn al-Walid. So if I 
drink something, will it have any effect on me? If I have the same intention as Khalid ibn Walid, I said, listen, you're not Khalid ibn Walid. <laughs> so, do remember, they, they were a different people altogether. So, yes, drink of the water of Zamzam, but don't take my name if you try to go with, without food for 40 days. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable all of us to understand. May Allah make us amongst those who are benefited by the water of Zamzam. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala abdihi wa rasulih nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik nashadu wa la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruk wa natubu ilayk.